Hey, welcome back to the Naval News, everybody. I hope you had a great week. This video is sponsored by Private Internet Access. Thank you to them for sponsoring today's video. So a lot of news organizations have come out and said that the AUKUS agreement that's going to be updated on Monday uh, is actually including four or five American Virginia class submarines going to Australia and not the two astutes that were originally uh, leaked. So there is a big difference between the modern Block 4, Block 5 Virginia class and the Astute. One, it's a more modern design, more recent design. This includes system upgrades on both the software and the hardware side that make it, again, more recent. Not necessarily more capable, but certainly newer equipment, hardware, and software. Uh, the design is for littoral operations in the Virginia class, where the Astute is not specifically designed for that. I'm not saying it can't do that, but Virginia class submarines from the drawing board had littoral shallow water operations in mind as well as deep blue water operations. Uh, they, the Virginia does have an improved ESM suite, so that's great for intelligence gathering and um, peacetime missions like that. The public test depth for the Virginia class is 1,600 feet, and knowing how test depth is calculated, that means there's a potential in deep water that the Virginia class could actually outdive older generations, lightweight torpedoes, where they wouldn't even be able to get down to them. Again, that would require a deep water environment. And most importantly to me, and I'm kind of biased here, the acoustic superiority package on the Virginia class is outstanding. It's been upgraded since block three, and now that we're on block five, it is so good. But it's all also very sensitive, so we can't really talk about that. And then the big thing is it all runs on Windows 11, which makes everybody really happy. So good job to Australia getting the uh, Virginia class, assuming that that's the case. Uh, the public announcement will be on Monday, just in three days from this recording. I will be live streaming that uh, event from San Diego. So if you want to see that in my live reaction to it, uh, definitely click the bell icon on the YouTube so you get the notification for when I go live on this channel. I don't live stream often on this channel, uh, but that's going to be something that we're going to do and find out together in real time what the actual deal is. Is it five Virginia? Is it two astute? Is it a combination of the two or something completely different and everybody's wrong? Yeah. All right. Now a word from our sponsor. Thank you to Private Internet Access for sponsoring this video. Private Internet Access is a low-cost, high-speed, virtual private network service provider. When you're connected to the internet on public Wi-Fi or even at home, your data is at risk of being stolen. Hackers that are connected to the same Wi-Fi can view your keystrokes, passwords, browsing, and personal data. Private Internet Access helps protect you by hiding your IP address and encrypting your data through their world-class server infrastructure. Using the internet without PIA is like using a changing room with no door. Everyone can see your shorts and will leave disappointed. I use private internet access every time I travel. It ensures that my connection is private and encrypts peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. PIA has a no logs policy. This has been proven multiple times in court by a third party independent auditor. Private internet access also allows you access to region restricted content from all major streaming services. So when I'm meeting my sources in Australia, I can still watch my favorite shows. PIA is available on all platforms, Windows, Mac OS, Android, Linux, and iOS. And one subscription can be used on 10 devices at the same time. Use my link in the description to grab an 83% discount on private internet access. That's just $2.03 a month, and you get four extra months for free. Sign up with private internet access is risk-free. There's a 30-day money-back guarantee, and 24-7 customer support is available. Use my link in the description and protect yourself with private internet access. And welcome back. So today we're going to take a little bit broader view on China's expansion across the globe. Last month, we looked heavily at the South China Sea, the Nine Dash Line, its occupation of that body of water through shoals, uh, islands, and atolls, expanding land masses, putting air stations and military bases on those atolls, and then expanding or projecting power past that first island chain in the south, south of Taiwan. Now, I want to address a couple YouTube comments remind that they reminded me that the South China Sea is inside the first island chain and they're absolutely right but by building those bases in the South China Sea they're able to project air and sea power past that first island chain 
And that's what I was referring to whenever I said that. So I just want to make that clear. But let's take a look at the screen here. Uh, this one is courtesy of silkroadbriefing.com, great website. And they highlight the major cities that the Belt and Road Initiative connect to. It involves over 147 countries now. Uh, this was originally announced only 10 years ago, 10, uh, in 2013, uh, with its first investment in Ka Kazakhstan, if I'm saying that country name right. But a lot of people argue that the Belt and Road actually began back in the 1990s with internal infrastructure improvements in China. So there's an argument to be made for, for that as well. This is all Chinese funded infrastructure product, uh, projects in foreign countries. They use Chinese workers that are shipped to these other countries that do the job, they get paid in Chinese money, and then they bring that money home again. There's not a lot of benefit to these countries hosting these projects other than they're getting a major port, which they see as valuable, and it can be valuable. Uh, you know, if they can do things like get tax revenue, and we'll cover some of that later on in this uh, story. But the, the Belt and Road Initiative is sold to uh, the rest of the world as a global connected Europe, you know, globally connected Europe. But if you look at the map, everything that's in the European sphere of influence is only connected back to China. So all roads really lead to Beijing in this case. And uh, this was also known as Build Back Better, but that phrase has been used for a couple of American projects as well. So uh, most people I think referred to this as the BRI Belt and Road Initiative, because that's what it is. And the globally connected Europe is the sales pitch, the tagline, if you will. Now, so we were moving from the South China Sea there, south of China, uh, out to uh, you know Africa and Europe, and what they're doing now is they're moving into South America. This completes the belt around the globe. Let's begin in 2014, only nine short years ago, yeah, nine, uh, when pre uh, the president of Argentina signed a non-public, originally this was not public, deal with China to establish and operate a deep space array, monitoring station, whatever you want to call it, in a province in, in Argentina. It is a 50-year agreement. This, this agreement is now public and we've read the articles of it. Article 1 states that this is a 50-year agreement that China can operate uh, this, this facility. Uh, Article 2 says it restricts Article or Argentina control over the property. This is essentially Chinese territory inside the fence line of this large facility that's outside of any city. It's not really near anything. It's out in the middle of nowhere. You wouldn't even know it's there if you didn't see the big array and the fence line around it, right? But it's quite literally, in effect, Chinese property in Argentina now. That's part of the deal. Uh, Article 3 covered tax exemptions uh, and a simplified movement in and out of the country for Chinese citizens that work at this facility. So they don't have to go through the normal uh, duty and, um, you know, import taxes and things like that for things that they bring in and out of the country. Uh, they just come right to this base, they work for a fixed period of time, Chinese citizens do, and then they fly back to China again and they have this rotation going on operating this deep space array. It is operated by uh, the Chinese Space Agency that's controlled by the military. It's the China Satellite Launch and Tracking Control General is the name of the, uh, of the operation that, op that runs this. So it, this is what we call a dual use site. So publicly, this is a civilian project run by the military uh, that's doing whatever deep space research that they wanna get done. But this array is more than capable to easily monitor any satellites from any country that fly overhead. And so that is an intelligence gathering uh, purpose that could be used and America argues is being used, being employed uh, by, by this site. But it's in Argentina and uh, outside the United States jurisdiction. So let's move a little bit up the coast to Peru. The next and probably the most recent large project that's happening in uh, South America is the Chance Bay Peru uh, shipping port that's being built. This is a $3 billion port. It's huge. It's over 1,100 hectares of space. Uh, this container ship port is uh, st uh, being built by the Chinese state-owned conglomerate Costco. Uh, Costco Shipping and Holding is the full name, not the Costco here in the United States. Do not get those two co companies confused. It is a 16 meter deep natural harbor, can handle any container ship in the world. 
construction is underway right now. And Peru negotiated a lot better deal for this for themselves than Argentina did because uh, they are using a lot of Peruvian labor. They kind of can't help it. This project is so big. Uh, they're using Chinese and local labor uh, to, to get it built as fast as possible. This will become the major Chinese shipping port in uh, South America when it's complete. I don't know when that's gonna be, maybe a year or two, uh, but we'll assume that it won't take that long despite the scope of this project. The next one is the golden or the lithium triangle, uh, also called white gold. Uh, the, the new gold of the world is lithium because that's what we're putting in all of our devices now, whether it's your, your phone, your electric vehicle, or your military UAV, or uh, powering your direct energy weapon on board your ship. Uh, the power source that acts as a battery for that, uh, it has lithium in it. And approximately 54 to 58% of the globe's lithium is in this triangle between Chile, Bolivia, and Argentina. And these countries are cashing in on that, selling it to anybody that wants to come and get it. And China is coming to get it. Russia's also there. I would not be surprised if there's a lot of American companies uh, looking, if not already there, to, uh, to get the lithium out of them. But just be aware that China is also involved in getting as much lithium as they can, as fast as they can out of this region for themselves. Because the more that they have, the more they have on the market or the less other countries like the United States has to use for, for our projects. So that is a big part of what's going on in South America right now. This week, the United States Armed Services Committee received a briefing from a number of experts, one of which was General Van Herc here. And uh, he was saying that 24 nations in the Latin America region are using Chinese Huawei telecommunication enterprise infrastructures, that's servers, routers, you know, transmitters, antennas, the whole kit for their telecommunications. One of the reasons why this is important for Latin America is Chinese-based Huawei uh, sells or leases that equipment at a very low cost. Some would even say a loss leader. So why are they essentially losing money selling infra or you know te telecommunication information or equipment to other countries? Well, what we found and why we no longer allow Huawei to operate anywhere in the United States is that there is additional hardware in each one of these routers and servers. It is believed, allegedly, that that additional hardware is actually a back door for people in China, operatives in China, military in China, to log in privately, secretly, without detection into each one of these servers, routers, or whatever infra infrastructure there is and um, operate the router. Essentially, they could shut it down if they wanted to. And a lot of this telecommunication connects cities in Latin America, including their power grid and their water processing stations. So, yeah, you're getting a bargain when you buy a Huawei you know, telecommunication system. It's very inexpensive to install and operate and maintain, but you're also giving up potentially a, secure, a major security risk to anyone in China that wanted to log in and uh, turn off your water or your power. So uh, that's, that's going on in uh, Latin America. That was uh, briefed to the U.S. Armed Services Committee this week. And it's, it's a big problem for us, not that it affects the United States directly, but think of our supply chains, how much of our trade comes out of Mexico. You know, it's, it's a lot. And so if Mexico is having problems with China and China is controlling indirectly their water and power, well, that gives China a big negotiation, you know, point. Anyway, hopefully it doesn't come to that, but just know that a lot of South America is running this Huawei hardware, and uh, we believe, the United States believes that it's compromised uh, to, for cyber attacks out of China. And then finally, let's take a look at this uh, global chart of the Belt and Road Initiative. This is coming from, uh, let's see, uh, Kling and Dahl, if I'm saying that right, .org, and BeltandRoadResearch.com both have the same graphic. Shout out to those guys doing great work over there. And they show you globally what Belt and Road looks like. Obviously, it's been, you know, moving westward from China for, you know, 10 years now. So they're connected to places like, you know, Greece, Rotterdam, England, of course, uh, J Djibouti and Jakarta. Those are some major, major ports. Even Singapore is on this list where they have a minority stake in that, in that large uh, seaport region. And you can see now they've also included the port that's under construction in Peru, completing the belt. They can get and trade anything just about anywhere in the globe except 
with the United States in our region and, and Australia down there. They've, they've, they've done a great job. Whether you agree with China and their politics and all their abuses, uh, which we can all, I think, agree is bad, uh, what they've done here with the Belt and Road Initiative, pragmatically, it should be applauded. This is, this is a success. They've, they've done it. They, they've put a belt of trade around the globe that they've built themselves. They've negotiated these deals with these countries. They've used Chinese money to pay Chinese workers to build these ports and then take control either in a majority or a minority stake in these ports. They even operate warships out of the ports in uh, Djibouti, for example. And there's speculation that they'll be doing the same out of either Peru or somewhere else in uh, South America, just so they have forward deployed warships much like the United States has. Something that I should mention here at the end, Russia is also improving its relations with Venezuela, Brazil, and Cuba, including talks to put troops boots on the ground in Cuba, a la the 1960s. So we'll see what actually comes of that. Russia is all a lot of talk and not a lot of action. So that may not actually happen, but you should be aware that there is a lot going on in South America and the Caribbean right now, and it's not being reported on widely. So this is just a little teaser for you. And as things develop, we'll bring you more information, all right? Hey, don't forget to support our sponsor, Private Internet Access. Uh, click the link in the description and uh, support the people that support this channel, all right? Thank you. Have a great weekend, everybody. Bye.